John, thank you very much for that introduction and for the invitation uh, to speak this evening. And I should like to start by joining you in tribute to Edward Mortimer, who certainly started me thinking about contested histories and I suspect taught all of us to think both more clearly and more charitably uh, about contested histories. On the 12th of June, 1936, President Roosevelt unveiled this statue in Dallas. It's a statue of Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general, and it was to honor the Confederate veterans. He said, I'm very happy to take part in this unveiling of the statue of General Robert E. Lee. All over the United States, we recognize him as a great leader of men, as a great general. But also, all over the United States, I believe that we recognize him as something much more important than that. We recognize Robert E. Lee as one of our greatest American Christians and one of our greatest American gentlemen. It's an extraordinary statement for Roosevelt to be making in 1936. Roosevelt knew perfectly well what the Civil War had been about and knew better than anybody the role that Robert E. Lee had played in it. It's, I think, a good place to start because we all know why Roosevelt told that story, presented that history in a public place with this object. Because that was the story, the history, that the South needed in the 1930s to keep Democrat support for Roosevelt in everything else he wanted to do. It was the necessary narrative for building a new society. Rather oddly, a contradictory one, we might now think, but an essential one. The president told a story, a history, that reshaped the thinking of the past to make a different future. And exactly a week ago, another president did exactly the same thing. A week ago, President Macron brought into the Pantheon in Paris the empty coffin of Josephine Baker, the black dancer who had left the southern states a little before Roosevelt made that speech to seek her fortune in Paris, where she became the toast of the Folie Bergère with her banana dance, the perfect racist demonstration of that kind of public entertainment in 1920s Paris. She later became uh, a member of the French resistance and became a French citizen and adopted children from all over the world whom she brought to France and raised as French citizens. She is therefore, as you can imagine, a very good story for President Macron to be telling at the moment, to introduce to the pantheon of France, the woman who chose to be a French citizen, who fought for French freedom, and who then adopted from all over the world other people who would be French citizens and brought them up as hers. Héroïne de guerre, combattante, danseuse, chanteuse, noire, défendant les noirs, mais d'abord femme, défendant les humains, américaine et française. Uh, he does it even better. Um, uh, and he summed it all up that she, in this incarnation, represents l'insaisissable beauté de notre destin collectif, the ungraspable, indefinable beauty of our collective destiny. And of course, the key point in 1936 Dallas and 2021 Paris is that we don't have a collective destiny. We're trying to construct one. And for centuries, we in Europe and the United States have tried to conduct those uh, by building statues in public places. The Paris Pantheon is the perfect demonstration of that movement, the culmination of movement of 18th century thinking, where in the secularized church of St. Genevieve, the saints of the past, who we were there to emulate, who would show us what we ought to become, were replaced by secular heroes who would lead us, guide us, and who would also, like the saints, be constantly augmented by new canonizations as others fell into, if not exactly desuetude, then 
uh, benign neglect. And the English had got here first, but not exactly as you might expect, not through the state. I think one of the first examples of this is the magnificent Temple of the British Worthies at Stowe. We're in the 1730s, and Lord Cobham is a Whig lined up with the Prince of Wales, bitterly opposed to the equally Whig, but very corrupt, and as it happens, Prime Minister Walpole. And he does, in his garden with William Kent, he lays out a garden which is also an ideology. It's the English garden of different spaces leading you unexpectedly on and forward until you come to a particular shrine, a temple, an idea. You leave the temple of ancient virtue with the great heroes of Greece and you cross the water to the temple of British worthies. Sixteen of them, busts by Risebrack, architecture by Kent, who had also done the garden. And this is what Cobham felt was the true history of Britain. These were our saints that would shape us, our nation, our, nat our understanding of the future. British were 34, 1734 were between the two Jacobite rebellions, the end of the long civil war when Britishness still needs to be articulated in a very particular way. And as you can see, it splits into two sets of eight. On the left hand side, eight thinkers, writers, people like Milton, Shakespeare, Newton, Bacon, Pope. And on the right, the doers, mostly rulers. But so there's Drake, there's Raleigh, there's Elizabeth, there's Hamden fighting for the rights uh, of the citizen against the parliament, of the parliament against the king. Um, and there is the Black Prince, because we're rather interested in Princes of Wales at the moment in this time, and Alfred. We go back to Alfred, and all these are the people who kept the values of our country safe, who fought for the values of, uh, of our country against central power, if necessary, like Hamden, against the foreigner, like Elizabeth, uh, and Drake, or indeed the foreigner who came to rescue our values, like William of Orange. It's an extraordinarily interesting grouping. Fifteen men, one woman. But all about a clear narrative of who we have been, and that will tell us who we are. Because that's the point of the public statue, and this is very public. Although it's a private house, the garden is from the beginning meant to be visited. Uh, it has guidebooks very early on, and they build very near this uh, what is thought to be the first tourist hotel in Britain. Um, and contemporary accounts suggest it was just as dreadful as everyone since. <laughs> um, uh, everybody advising you to find a rich friend nearby where you can stay rather than face the inn. But it's a public statement. And you have, I think, first of all, a very interesting French-British distinction. The French also go through a series of statues of the grands hommes, the great men, in order to show the France that later Jean Givier and Louis XVI want French citizens to become. That's done from the centre by central power. This is done outside against the central power. And it's a model, selecting the people of the past to tell you who you are, who you want to be, becomes a standard thing of Britain outside London, and particularly in our great cities. And I want to uh, to start with my great city, uh, Glasgow. George Square in Glasgow, uh, laid out in 1781, when Glasgow, of course an anti-Jacobite city, is very much a British city, not a Scottish one, uh, calling itself part of North Britain uh, in that rather conscious way. And from the 1830s on, it begins to get furnished with statues that tell you what it means to be Scottish, to be West Scottish, because Edinburgh is a different country uh, uh, that we don't really need to bother with. Um, and what it means to be in this great commercial city, huge commercial city, um, in the 1830s, with at the end, as you can see, the city chambers uh, of the 1880s, and in front of that, the cenotaph, um, which, of course, dominates the square, as you'd expect. Right in the middle, I hope you can see, the first, the first monument is Walter Scott on the column. 
well before Edinburgh got round to doing its monument, he is here. And Walter Scott, because he is, of course, not only the most famous Scot in the world at the time, shaping European literature, but he is, of course, the great unionist who brought George IV to Scotland, made him wear a kilt, reinvented tartans. Scott is the hero of the new Scotland, thinking about itself. And it's an anti-Jacobite Scotland. So very early on, statue of uh, Victoria and of uh, Albert by Marochetti. And then what does it mean to be Scottish in this world? Who are you if you're in the west of Scotland? Well, you're first, of course, you're a scientist, you're an engineer. So James Watt is present. The whole steam engine, the whole industrial revolution, the, w revolution, the world changed by this man. But you're also, of course, a land of poets. And none of your poncy Edinburgh kind of poets. You've got a real ploughman poet uh, in Burns, who is, of course, an, an, a global figure in a different way. You're an engineer, you're a poet, and you're also, of course, a soldier. Here is Lord Clyde, uh, who had fought in the Peninsula War, in the Crimean War, and had effectively put down the great Indian Rebellion of 1857. This is Glasgow of military adventure and the empire, which has made it so rich. And the two politicians that have to be here as well are, first of all, Peel, because of his free trade, his opening to the world, and Gladstone, because by the end of the century, Glasgow is an Irish city as well. What's going on here is, I think, something extraordinary. The construction of a national identity through public statues, a selective history that, taken together, tells a very coherent story. And it's always been, Lord George Square, a place of public debate, political debate. It's in George Square in 1919 that the great communist riot brings in the army. Red Clyde side fights its battles in George Square. And last summer, uh, this is is that this is the right this is Peel, isn't it? Yes, you can see Peel was uh, attacked uh, as part of a Black Lives protest. The statues, the political statues, are quite often vandalised. Not interestingly, the others. It's, I think, a very good place to begin thinking about how we, in the public realm, with civic engagement, think about our history and what we add to our history. All these statues are put up after debate in the city council, uh, which with varying degrees of democratic uh, legitimacy uh, through the period uh, made the decisions. And I think you can see how coherent each one of them is. And we'll come back later on to what is going to happen there now, or what is happening there now. But what I want to argue is that none of these statues None of these stories can be forever, because the statue that Roosevelt inaugurated in 1936 had to be removed in 2017, because in 2017, white nationalists had rallied the group called Unite the Right to protest against another statue of Lee being removed. And in that rally, a woman was killed. So in 2017, the local, the municipal authorities of Dallas decided to remove it. It disappeared, and it reappeared. Um, this is it being taken out. A wonderfully sinister figure on the right uh, watching this happening. Um, and it reappeared uh, two months ago uh, only at the uh, Lajitas Golf Resort in Texas, uh, with who knows what meaning for those who are members of the Lajitas Golf Resort. Lee, it's interesting, was moved from Dallas in 2017 because already it was felt that the story that Lee represented was no longer a story that could be told in the southern states or elsewhere in America. As you all know, on the 25th of May last year, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. And that led to another great wave of statues of Lee being removed. This wonderful picture, I think deliberately taken to emulate a lynching um, of him being removed from Charleston. Uh, 
But what it was on the 10th of July. I mean, the, I want to talk a little bit about the dates of 2020 because the speed of all this is so interesting. George Floyd is murdered the 25th of May. This, due to public protest, is moved on the 10th of July. But very interestingly, and not entirely accidentally, this statue had been destroyed on the 22nd of May. What you're looking at is the statue in Martinique, uh, in Fort de France, the capital of Martinique, of Schilcher. Schilcher is effectively the French Wilberforce. He's the man who campaigns for the abolition of slavery in the French Empire. And in 1848, it is eventually voted. Uh, one of the first things the New Republic does, uh, they abolish slavery. And this, in the capital of Martinique, of course, a great slave uh, colony, uh, is the statue honoring Schilcher. For decades, local, uh, local citizens had been complaining that this was the only image about the end of slavery, that you have the benign, sweet, gentle Frenchman giving freedom to this uh, saccharine, infantilized representative of, of what? Of enslaved people over centuries. The whole act of, of liberating the slaves being yet another generous gift of France to its colony. No mention at all of the fact that what is happening is that centuries of criminal activity are being ended. And no mention at all of the fact that the, the slaves themselves rose violently on many occasions. And indeed, once the law had been passed in 1848, the local slaves refused to wait to be freed by the French. They rose on the 22nd of May, 1848, two days before the uh, act was meant to come into force. And they took freedom. And they felt this representation was simply intolerable. A narrative of part of our destin collectif, which totally ignored the great majority of the population. And so on the 22nd of May, 2020, so before George Floyd, uh, it was destroyed after years of protest of trying to get an, an expanded narrative. What followed the Floyd killing was very remarkable. Robert E. Lee statues, as you might imagine, were removed everywhere as protests grew. But all around the world, something else began to happen. A sense that these statues were about one side of history, and that if we were going to have public narrative of history, it needed to be a narrative in which everybody or more people found their story. And the great figure that came to crystallize this in the United States was the statues of Columbus. This is Columbus in Boston, um, who was decapitated on the 9th of June, 2020. So uh, just two weeks after uh, Floyd was killed. But not because of black lives as such, but because of what Columbus now can, came to mean. And it is a very fascinating narrative. Why are the Columbus statues in the United States at all? It's because in the 1880s, the Italian and Spanish immigrants were so discriminated against in every way and often lynched that it was felt essential to reimagine the national narrative from the Pilgrim Fathers and the nice wasps arriving and making prosperity to include the Italians and the Spaniards. So they're put up mostly in the 1880s, right across the United States, to bring the Italians, above all the Italians, into the national narrative. By 2020, of course, it's clear that what Columbus may mean to the Europeans, promise, prosperity, wealth, is not what he meant to the original inhabitants of the Americas, where it's death, complete destruction of their societies, marginalization, expropriation. And so Columbus becomes an offensive image very quickly and very violently. This, as I say, is the 9th of June, uh, 2020. He's removed on the 11th of June. Um, on the 24th of June, Columbus, Ohio, a rather unfortunate name in the middle of all this, decides that its statue of Columbus has to be removed. And there's even 
a suggestion that the name of the city should be changed by popular referendum. In one week, of 9th to the 16th of June, 2020, this is uh, just over two weeks after George Floyd's death triggers all this, Columbus statues are removed in one week in Boston, Massachusetts, Richmond, Virginia, St. Paul, Minnesota, Houston, Texas, Wilmington, Delaware, Detroit, Michigan, Hartford, and New Haven, Connecticut, St. Louis, Missouri, and Sacramento in California, all in one week. And it goes on. I don't think there's ever been a moment like this in our public histories, where people realize that what we're doing with these statues is telling a narrative, and it's our narrative, and they're civic narratives, and they've got to keep changing, and you've got to decide how you do it. And particularly indigenous peoples all around the world. In Gisborne, North Island, New Zealand, the first place where Cook sets uh, foot on New Zealand in 1769, um, th there are two statues. Uh, one of them is removed because, again, for the Maori, this is the beginning of expropriation, the destruction of their society, and a whole series of injustices that still continue. And the word uh, the, uh, written below, thief, is, and uh, Revolt, I mean, later if I pronounce this properly, uh, got this right, it means thief in Maori. Uh, it means, sorry, it means white, it means a European settler. So you've got the thief European settler. Uh, uh, so one statue covered with graffiti, the other uh, removed. That's in New Zealand. Other end of the world, Greenland. The statue of Hans Egede, the Danish missionary who in the 18th century arrives, Christianizes, and uh, effectively begins the process that colonizes Greenland with all the consequences for the Inuit <coughs> population. Here, in a very predictable Danish way, they decide this is Nuuk in, uh, in Greenland, the capital of Greenland, um, and this is mid-July 2020. This is all happening within days right around the world. Um, they decide that all 56,000 inhabitants of Greenland should vote on whether this statue stays or not, and they decide that it should, but that there should be some more explanation, further comment. This is, I think, a very big question. How do you deal with statues that are there that tell a story that's either partial or no longer acceptable? What's the best way to do it? And how do you handle it? I want to look at, very quickly, at three examples that I think show different ways of doing it. And you will not be surprised, I think, then, that two of them are in Germany, because the Germans, better than anybody, have tackled the question of how do you address a history that is either ideologically unbearable to present and to look at and to endorse, or simply exclusive. And what you're looking at is, as you can see, a startlingly ugly, uh, very, very large brick elephant, uh, which is in Bremen, the uh, North Sea Great Harbor City, which is also a land in the Federal Republic of Germany. And it was put up in the early 1930s. Uh, Bremen had done extraordinarily well out of the German colonial empire, uh, like Hamburg. This was where the, uh, the, uh, the goods arrived. And it was particularly hit by the loss of the colonies at the Versailles Treaty of 1919. And the severing of Germany from its colonial past and its colonial present. And so in the early 1930s, they put up this monument to the soldiers who had died defending German Southwest Africa, what is now Namibia, uh, the colony of Namibia. Um, it's very interesting that this is after Versailles. So in a sense, it's a repudiation of Versailles saying these, this was a good thing to do, our soldiers were heroic. And the soldiers who are commemorated, not just those who died actually conquering Namibia, but defending it in the First World War against the British and South African troops that then took it over as a mandate. It was inaugurated uh, in the early 30s with great support from the right wing, as you can imagine. Many of the people behind it uh, later went on to play leading roles in the Nazi hierarchy. And it's a particularly complicated image and memorial because 
the conquest of Namibia was among the most brutal of any of the European conquests, and particularly because in the late 1890s, the German army drove the Nama and the Herero people into the desert with instructions to keep them there until they died of thirst and hunger, uh, men, women, and children. It's, uh, I mean, there are many colonial atrocities, as we all know. This has become, and particularly in German history, a very particular one because it was men, women, and children driven out to die. And it has been recognized by the German government as a genocide. It takes an extra twist in German historiography because for many today, many German historians, this moment of driving a people out into the wilderness to die is the first step towards Auschwitz, towards the Shoah. And many would argue you couldn't have got to that without the Namibian campaign. It's a contested view, but it's a widely held one and a very strongly held one. So this monument has a very particular set of resonances. With that great irony that history uh, so enjoys, Bremen City was almost completely devastated. This hideous object remained intact, <laughs> completely intact. And what do you do with it? Well, for most of the 50s and 60s, there, was that, there were other things to think about, and you could simply pretend it wasn't there. But then, of course, it became more and more important for the city, the land, to decide and it was free to decide. What should you do? It had been designed as a Reichskolonial Ehrendenkmal, one word, of course, um, this being German, um, a monument in honor of the, of, of, of the imperial colonial uh, uh, enterprise. It couldn't, obviously, stay like that. So when Namibia becomes independent in 1990, the local parliament decides not to remove it or demolish it, or that's discussed, but they should simply repurpose it. It should become an anti-colonial Denkmal monument. And it should carry a new inscription saying that it's a symbol for the responsibility which we incur by looking at history. Ein Symbol für die Verantwortung, die uns aus der Geschichte erwächst. It's about our responsibility to the past. And that's why it has to stay and be looked at. And they couple the repurposing with program of help to Namibia to build a Department of Constitutional Law, to work with lawyers uh, and with a number of educational projects. In 1996, they decide they will add, when the Namibian president arrives, a new inscription commemorating the Namibian victims. They left the names of the German soldiers but they've now added the, a name, an inscription commemorating the Namibian victims, obviously no names. And then, and this shows you the scale of it and the ceremonies that take place around the plinth of it. But then this was still felt not to be enough. And in 2009, this small installation is placed beside it, meant to evoke the desert into which the people were driven, designed by colleagues from Namibia. And every year, there is an annual ceremony of remembrance and repentance. That's a mix that the British never seem to have been able to get to. Remembrance, we do very well. But that adding the coupling to remembrance of repentance is something that um, is very, very important here, and uh, is, I think, a very typical German way of doing it. What has happened is that the story's been enlarged. The same monument remains, it means something else, and it embraces more people. It is, I think, an extraordinary civic achievement, all decided by the parliament of the Land Bremen. At the other end of the world, in a much more light-hearted way, Singapore had to confront the same thing. Singapore, founded, as you know, in 1819 by Raffles. Uh, here he is on the left, bronze statue put up in Victoria's Jubilee year, and the father of the great city that becomes the imperial hub and the great uh, 
world commercial centre of today. And astonishingly, this statue remains from 1887 right through the Japanese occupation. And the reverence for Raffles as the founder of the city survives the defeat by the Japanese, the occupation by the Japanese, survives independence. He stays as the symbol, the father of the city, the father of the new state. But, and indeed so much so that, and I think something, a gesture that must be unique in colonial history, in 1972, after independence, they make a copy, a second one, because Raffles had arrived at the river, Singapore River, the bronze statue was in front of the, 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 the government house building. They want to copy in polymarble, <coughs> I think is the technical word, and they put this copy by Singapore River. So you have two statues of Raffles put up by an independent Singapore. He still has this role. By the time he comes to 2019, so the bicentenary of Raffles' <coughs> arrival, it's no longer possible just to stay with this history. The race riots that have been endemic and the racial tensions that have been endemic for over 50 years, well over 50 years in Singapore, can no longer be concealed uh, or wrapped up in this one imperial moment. There are lots and lots of people in Singapore who have got nothing to do with raffles and indeed who are not in any sense part of a British uh, imperial narrative. So what do you do? How do you create a new story in the public place for everybody. They decide to commission an artist, Ten Kai Wei, and late in 2018, just before the centenary, he takes the right hand statue, as you can see, um, and he paints it into a kind of camouflage with the same gridding of the windows and the, 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 the verticals of the structure behind. So that when you stand in front of it in December 2018, Raffles has almost disappeared. And then, when Independence Bicentenary, when Bicentenary Day year dawns in January, Raffles wakes up and he's out of camouflage, but he's no longer alone. <laughs> he's surrounded by four others who have gone up overnight. And the four others are the Sumatran prince, who, according to legend, dreamt of a lion in the 14th century and called the place Singapore, the town of the lion. And also uh, of uh, three other people who arrived also in 1819, the same year as Raffles. Uh, Munshi Abdullah, who was a scholar of Malay culture. Narayana Pillai, who's an Indian entrepreneur and built the first Hindu temple. And Tantok Seng, who's a Chinese entrepreneur and a great philanthropist. There's still a hospital named after him. So what you've done, what the Singapore people did in this brilliantly witty way, is suddenly you says, these are the people that all of them made Singapore. And they're all part of the narrative, and you can walk through the narrative. And Raffles now is not so much there as the founder, but as the representative of a global Anglophone trading world. All the rest has been done by the other people. Is this a model? Is this a model we can use? It's done top down, but it raises very big questions, and very happily, and was done with a great deal of style, and was very, very well received. Unfortunately, it was only a temporary thing. It only stayed for the year, and there's a debate about whether it should somehow be reconstructed. But it is, I think, an example worth bearing in mind. And then, finally, this is what we are, what we want to be, different traditions living together. What about that other question of what we don't want to be, what we need to have in the past to remember not to become again? It's something that, again, in Britain and in France, I think we're extraordinarily bad at. We don't like to acknowledge those things, let alone think about them so that we don't repeat the mistakes. This is the Citadel of Spandau, uh, just outside Berlin. And it has become, uh, since uh, f f f in, in the last four years, um, the, um, a, a permanent display called Berlin Unveiled, Berlin Enthüllt. And in it, 
are statues that have been were once on public display in Berlin and are now to be shown here because they represent the three catastrophes of Germany in the 20th century. The militarist imperialist aggression of the Wilhelmine years, the Nazi uh, era, and the communist tyranny of the, East, of the German Democratic Republic. And what is done is they're all presented as they were found, hardly on a plinth at all, almost at uh, on our own eye level. The plinth is simply to stop you um, actually tripping over them. It's a remarkable achievement because what it does, these are the Wilhelmine statues from the Tiergarten, groups of them all along the Tiergarten, where before the First World War, as you walked with the children on Sunday, you could stop to examine the field marshals, the princes, the generals, and some of the writers uh, whoever, who had made Germany great. They were badly damaged by bombing, and the decision was taken here to restore nothing. You show the object as it has suffered by time, either by damage of war or by deliberate damaging and destruction. You show the memory and the damnatio memoriae together, and you show the object without the aura. It's a remarkable gift, I think, of how you present material without endorsing it. There are no labels near the things. There are very, very full accounts and information on screens. And as you walk through, you can see very clearly um, the, 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 w where the groups are and what they stand for. They're shown as they, exactly as they are, and they're quite surprising. This is one of the groups of the, 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 of the 18th century militarist groups. And uh, unfortunately, I have to tell you, the little figure on the left, the bust on the left, is, or the headless bust, is actually Immanuel Kant. Uh, everybody suffers when things go wrong like this. This is the militarist bit. The Nazi section is equally terrifying, a church bell with a swastika and an inscription pointing out that, explaining the circumstances of this and reminding you that church bells, that both churches, to a very large extent, supported or at least did not resist the regime, again shown in the same way. And the same for the, 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 the Stasi uh, occupy, uh, uh, period in East Germany, the head of the statue of Lenin that was once in Friedrichshain. Um, as it was found, it was removed in 1990 and buried uh, as though somehow nobody would remember where it was and was only excavated uh, in 2014. And you can still see the bolts in it that were used to get it out of the earth. What is, I think, fascinating about this museum is that it's a museum of what we don't want to be. It's a museum that we have to keep in public view to remind us not to repeat the same mistakes. It reminds us of what, not what, what we did wrong because of what we got wrong. And at every stage you're reminded that people like us, exactly like us, thought these statues represented something admirable at one point, and that that's the important thing to think about. How does that happen? How do societies get into that position? And what are we not thinking about? So it's a challenge to think about that. And unusually in a museum, the curators don't see the things as there forever. Uh, one quick example, Tailman, Ernst Tailman, the leader of the Communist Party in the 1920s, uh, after the First World War, the great heroic leader, uh, resistant to Hitler and the Nazis, and eventually shot in Buchenwald in 1944. Uh, the monument put up under the, the German Democratic Republic, huge monument, as you can see from the scale, with these two enormous inscriptions uh, uh, about his life. After 1989, 1990, what do you do with this? Tellmann is, of course, a hero of resistance against the Nazis, but he's also one of those communists who fought against the Social Democrats in the 1920s and therefore was responsible for destroying, in many ways, the Weimar Republic's democratic attempts. A very ambivalent figure. It's decided 
after local consent that he should go to Spandau. He should be taken away. And they discover, rather wonderfully, that they just can't. He's too heavy. He's too big. So what goes to Spandau are the inscriptions. Um, in the state, they are. And now, very fascinating, there's a suggestion they should go back because opinions have moved. Opinions about the German Democratic Republic, about the complexities of communism, the complexities of resistance to fascism, that maybe they should go back. And the idea is that there will be a local consultation. And the curators expect objects to go back if people feel they ought to go back under certain ways. This is a remarkable notion of a public deciding how they want to use their memory in the civic way. That brings us back to us. <laughs> and very quickly to finish on what's happening in Britain at the moment and how we might use some of these examples in our debate about the past we need, the histories we want to tell through sculptures, monuments in the public place. Stowe is still there. Stowe last year had a brilliant idea that it was time to reverse, to ask people who would you put in the British where there is now. And instead of 15 men and one woman, they asked the public to choose 15 women and one man. Uh, the women were wonderfully admirable and predictable. Uh, Ada Lovelace, computer, that kind of thing. The one man, would anyone like to guess? The one man was David Attenborough, <laughs> <laughs> um, taking the place of Queen Elizabeth. But we've got ourselves into a muddle, I think. You all remember this amazing sequence of events when the Colson statue was taken down. And you all remember that this was after years of requests for a plaque to expand the narrative, not to deny Colson's philanthropic work, but to expand the narrative, a request that, for whatever reason, was not met by the local authorities and led to this. It's, I think, a very interesting example of, of a failure of the city and a very worrying moment when the central government, the minister of the day, said that this ought not to be a decision for the local government, but that central government should decide whether or not a statue could be removed, totally against everything in the British tradition of public debate, public commemoration, but a very, very significant moment. In Glasgow, again, do we need a different George Square? For the Commonwealth Games, it was thought that we might, think, might rethink the square, and several plans were drawn up which could have involved moving all the statues except the cenotaph. <coughs> the public outcry was so great that the citizens, uh, that the, the, the council abandoned the attempt. And that, I think, again, raises a very complicated point. How do you order public debate so that it can lead to something? It's, the Glasgow City Council tried and simply had to give up. They couldn't find a way through. And we're going to be talking about that, I know, in a moment. But what did happen in Glasgow was a completely other attempt to add somebody. The leader of the rent strike in 1915. Uh, during the First World War, as you know, rents were put up uh, everywhere. And the, of course, the men were mostly, away, uh, were mostly fighting. And Mary Barber, uh, a very active Glasgow communist, led the women in a great rent strike of 1915, which ultimately led to the law being changed and protection for tenants and freezing of the rents. She became a great hero in Glasgow, and this is in her, the place where she lived, Govan, uh, on the south side of Glasgow. It was set up by a group of people who wanted to commemorate her, and they raised the money, and then they went to Creative Scotland, which is a government agency, who refused to join the funding because they felt there wasn't adequate local engagement. Uh, and so they raised the money themselves. There are conflicting views about the aesthetic quality of this object. Uh, but what is fascinating is that it corresponded to a need to have this story told by people who were prepared, ultimately, to raise the funding for it. <coughs> How do we get the right debate? Well, Liverpool is embarking on it at the moment. The pro or was the project uh, statues redressed, redressed, 
was, I think, a brilliant attempt to engage the citizens in the debate, putting them in clothes that they wouldn't normally wear. Liverpool has a statue of Columbus, uh, which was also dressed. But I thought it would be more fun to finish on Disraeli. Uh, Disraeli, who uh, I think would rather have appreciated this flamboyant <laughs> gesture. And whatever comments it may have uh, led to about him as a politician, he would have loved dressing up like this. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.